All right, one minute inshallah, one minute. We would like to start the program. Brothers who are standing in the back. Brothers who are standing in the back. <laughs> If your name is Brother Imtiyaz, <laughs> please come forward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's a fun, 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 it's a f
So make sure that if you go uh, on the Google and search for ICN space margin, if you go to YouTube and then search for ICN space margin, our logo will come up. Raise your hand if you know our logo. And click on that logo, and that way you'll become a subscriber. And with that, I would like to uh, invite Brother Kareem Irfan, our dear brother, to introduce the speaker for tonight. Black Malachi. Brothers and sisters, it's entirely fitting that we have had a very satisfying meal on this night, on this night in this sacred month of Rajab. One of the things that is significant about Rajab is, of course, uh, the Al Isra and Al Mirad, the miraculous journey from the Haram of Mecca to Masjid al-Aqsa in Al-Quds and then the ascension to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence. Now, the reason I'm mentioning that is we are all familiar with the actual details of the journey uh, and there are factual commandments that have come from it but there are very significant strategic aspects that are related to that particular journey. The spiritual shift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had planned for Muslims, the connection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was making for the long term about the Prophet wasalam, his confirmation as the seal of prophethood, as he was taken all the way over, met all of the prophets, led them in salah, and then even on the ascension, the different prophets that he met and the conversations that he had with Isa, Musa, Harun, Yahya, Ibrahim, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace and blessings be on him. The reason I mention that is today, brothers and sisters, when you hear the next speaker, keep that perspective in mind. He is going to jog your thinking selves. Because what he's engaged in, this institution, the USIPI, the United States, India Policy Institute, is focused strategically on research-based, policy-oriented, changes that can be brought about in India with the direct engagement of the government but on the basis of a long-term thought-out plan that will uh, that will result in the upliftment of not just the Muslim community but the minorities and the social structure around. So I want you to keep that in mind and I know the time is short but I'd be doing this service if I did not take two or three minutes to emphasize this gentleman who's speaking is more than eminently qualified to be here. And Dr. Uh, uh, Abu Saleh Sharif, he's the chief scholar at the USIPI. He's an economist, he's a demographer, he's an expert on human development and inclusive growth. He has served as the senior fellow and chief economist with the National Council of Applied Economic Research in New Delhi, and he has consulted. He's not one of those academics who are out there researching away in the libraries. He's consulted for the Indian government and international organizations on so many uh, projects of importance. For instance, many people here from the Hyderabad and the AP area, you'll be uh, pleased to know that he functioned on the 2010 Committee for Consultation on the Andhra Pradesh situation. It was formed by the Ministry of Home Affairs. Dr. Abu Saleh Sharif was a consultant on that. He was a member and secretary of the Indian Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh's high-level committee to report on social, economic, and educational status of the Muslim community in India. The resulting Sachar committee report, we are all, we have all, anybody from India has heard of that. that. That report was tabled in the Indian parliament in 2006, and it has since become an internationally recognized source for extensive debate on inclusive development across India and similar situations in different parts of the globe. He has served, helped the United Nations system. His consultative work established empirical links between the macro economies, health and educational programs, and then human development and human rights in Sudan and Maldives. And this gentleman is cons frequently consulted as an expert in that area. And it is outstanding that we have a Muslim organization like USIPI and Brother Rashid and all the others who are supporting this. Uh, it is incredible that they have been able to attract 
and keep a scholar and a demographer and an economist of this high <coughs> level of expertise and world recognition as their chief scholar. And they are working on matters that are of direct impact to anybody who has any connection to, uh, to India. Uh, th there's more that I wanted to talk about, but I will leave with this reminder. Every, my eyes have been opened by the work that is done by USIPI, and when I heard Dr. Saleh speak with passion and with the knowledge on, uh, on the basis of empirical research he has done, my outlook has completely changed in terms of uh, charitable work to be done in India. Because the work that USIPI does, the diversity, uh, uh, the, uh, the DDIS, the District Diversity Index, the compilation that they have put together of every single, let me repeat, every single district across India, where they have done their research and they have tabulated the status of minorities and Muslims to the extent that you can go look up how many are in what area, where are their needs, what is the impact. So I can tell you from now on, I could not justify in my conscience when I go out and support, alhamdulillah, so many causes which we all do, without turning to this institute and trying to gain and benefit from them, saying, how can my project fit in the level of priorities and what is the return on investment coming from these? So, brothers and sisters, I beg of you, please pay attention to this name, USIPI, to the extent you support any project in India. My appeal to you is, think about this because from the long-term perspective, if you're looking at 20, 30 years down the road, what is going to happen to the Muslim community? How will they be bootstrapping themselves and supporting themselves from growing? This is the strategic approach that is needed, and we have a scholar of the stature of Dr. Abdul Saleh Sharif. Please watch him off. I've never been so happy in my life. And inshallah, today's discourse, I presume that it will carry a good message. It will carry a good message. And uh, generally, uh, I'm very thankful for um, Rashid Ahmad, who is the president of uh, the US IPI, United States and India, US India Policy Institute. So, this is an institute where we do research, analysis and share that information to everybody who is interested in that. The outcome, the research, and mostly the people or institutions who use that knowledge of governments. In case of India, for example, national government, a ministry, the Reserve Bank of India, and the state governments. And then, there are civil society organizations, NGOs, international organizations, United Nations, the World Bank. So when we are talking here of certain knowledge, a particular type of knowledge, and that knowledge is written in the language in which these institutions understand. So the research is done about people. We can focus any group of people. In India, we have innumerable castes. There are many religions. Scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, Dalits, you people might have heard of. Very deprived and backward groups. Muslims, a large minority. And since such a committee report about 2006, where I was one of the members, we proved that the condition of Muslims is not as good as we expect that to happen. Why? The Muslim presence in India is thousands of years. And mostly thousands of years of rule, the Muslim rule was there. So we presume the condition of Muslims should have been better at the time of independence. But now, 60 years down the line, 
we find a certain problem in India with respect to the Muslim community. So understanding the problems of people and then analyzing it, when you do the analysis, then you have to use certain methodology. A methodology which is respected. If you tell a, a policy advice, you a particular number, argue a particular case, it has to meet certain standards set by the academic level. For example, I'm an economist, I'm a demographer. I also do social sociology kind of research. So I have to meet, uh, and our institution has to meet those benchmarks. If you don't meet those benchmarks, your knowledge sharing or the, or the documents which you prepare will not create any value. So you have to have a benchmark which is international. And that is one of the reasons why U.S. India Policy Institute is located in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., there are more than 1,000 think tanks in Washington, D.C. So this is U.S. India Policy Institute is a think tank working on U.S. India, more India-related economy, and sharing that knowledge with a specific focus on Muslim community. There is a request that you, you, you kindly keep quiet because people are getting disturbed here. So I request our sisters to kindly keep quiet right there. Thank you. 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 Thank for a certain purpose. The purpose is to negotiate with the policy. I will, I will come back and say what that policy is, why, why we have to negotiate with the policy, or policy institutions, why we need to do that in an in a, in course, a civilized society, a society which is based on certain principles which evolve from democracy, which evolve from modern system of governments. And within that frame, we as individuals and we as community, we as institution, mosque is an institution, for example, a college and a school is an institution. We as these institutions at the grassroots, we have to interact with the policy. If we don't interact with that policy, then actually we are not catching up with development. We are not catching up with the changing benchmarks in development. Because every country in the world, including African nations, are growing now. In fact, even in Africa, if you take, you know, there were days Africa was considered a dark continent. No more. Last 10 years, Africa is going a revolutionary change in development. There are still a lot of problems, but the change has begun. Now, this change in India, happened about 25 years ago. The similar change in China happened about 45 years ago. Globalization, integration with the modern world. Days are changing. When we were young, of my age, where was internet? Where was it? There was not even a TV. But you see how this modern technology is bringing value. What kind of value? It is increasing the human welfare. Today, access to internet is a human right. Access to internet is as important as access to food, access to healthcare, access to protecting our own lives. Internet is so important. Why? Because the whole world, the future world, is going to be based on the IT technology. Now, if we as a community have to grow, if we as a community has to present our the Islamic culture to the world as one of the best cultures the world has seen, then we have to go along with the developments. We can't stay back and then demonstrate 
the importance of a particular ideology. Not possible. You have to be along with the tide. You have to be present in today and we have to think about future. With this kind of introduction, I have still not started my lecture. I want to go to some specifics. I am a kind of uh, the person, the word you use is a cocktail of various. So I am an anthropologist because I studied rural India. My work started as an investigator where I would go and talk to people in their homes, sit down and write their families' histories. You know, very, very poor people, farmers, small blacksmith, wage laborer. Sometimes in villages you get some Muslim households. You know, uh, a Muslim um, butcher, for example, and of course a Muslim Peshwam. So I, in my early years, I tried to understand the, how the poorer communities in India live. Assalamu alaikum sisters, let me make a very humble appeal to you. You may think that you are speaking and we are not able to hear. Let me be very clear that it is really disturbing. Dr. Abu Saleh is a very soft speaking person. So please maintain the voice level zero so that we can benefit from his presence. He is going to present some very important information and that will inshallah benefit a lot of our brothers and sisters in India. Jazakum Allah khairan for your cooperation. Thank you. So, uh, so the reason why a, cut, a particular type of education is important in policy making is that when you do the policy or when you advise the government, you advise the government in the interest of increasing welfare of people. If there is an industrialist, let's say um, Ambani, now, if he goes and advise, for example, the Prime Minister of India, he will advise in the interest of increasing the welfare of his company. Now, sometimes a company, the welfare of the company is in its profits. But those profit is needed because that company produces certain type of value. No, Reliance is there in 25 different industries. It is there also in internet, for example. Now, if our internet supply has to be increased, then we have to ensure that uh, Ambani makes a proper negotiation with the government. Now, with respect to the, the communities, the people living in rural areas, in villages, in towns, in slums, particularly Muslim mohallas, if we have to communicate the problems of that community, what are the problems? Garibi hai, no employment, no adequate you know, resources, they have land but no um, uh, water for irrigation, they have a home but they don't have a road to reach out to their village, they have a, they have a lamp post but there is no electricity flowing. There are various problems. <coughs> These are all daily problems anywhere in the world people face. But in a country like United States, there is a system which has developed, market-based system. But in India, we have not gone to that level where you can buy everything with money. In India, even if you don't have money, even if you have money, you can't buy anything because they are not available. But some of these basic needs, minimum needs are needed for every human being in our country, a school, a primary school, for a child to go. And once a child finishes a primary school, she has to go to a middle school, she has to go to a high school, and then she has to go to college. You need, you need this accessible. When there is a disease, there is a sickness, you need a, 
dispensary where doctor is present. Sometimes dispensary is there, beautiful building. You go inside, doctor is not there. So what is the purpose of a dispensary with no doctor? So there are multiple problems. Now if we have to accumulate that knowledge, what kind of problems? Now here, uh, uh, Mr. Karim was telling about charity. We, as charitable people, the people who have a, a certain amount of wealth, we want to share that in the hope of you know, reducing pain and suffering of our fellow citizens, particularly Muslims. We want to do that, right? But how, as, a, as an individual or as a group of people, how many children can you educate? Or how many, how many women can be given medicines? So in the modern democracies, it is the responsibility of the government to provide these services. gas gas cylinder individuals to nahi de sakte na ek system bana hua hai government ke program se wo ja raha hai i know gas cylinder se kya hua yahan hum auraton ki baat kar rahe the hamare desh mein everybody know urdu here or hindi generally what happens is our women are subjected to huge amount of drudgery because 75% of citizens live in rural areas what is the kind of drudgery a woman normally would suffer? She has to cook. Husband doesn't help, like in the United States. kitchen, <laughs> if you don't wash your vessels, you are not going to get your food. <laughs> not in India. I got one visitor recently. You know, he is about 35 year old boy, a professor in Delhi University. He came to my home. So he was their guest for two days. And in my home, there is no woman because my wife lives in uh, Delhi now. She is coming next week. So omelet banana ke liye maine I told him to go. He did not know knew how to break an egg and put it into the tawa. <laughs> no, I was shocked. This is I know whom you are talking about. I was shocked. I said, Yeah, you don't even know how to break an egg and put an omelet. The, the guy blushed. He said, Sir, my parents jaldi shadi karwa diya. No, very. <laughs> he didn't have any opportunity to even go to the kitchen. <laughs> so, the treasury, we are talking of the woman's treasury. In the treasury of woman, is, she not only has to do this cooking, she has to collect vegetables, she has to bring everything, sometimes in the villages, and she has to go and bring lakriya kaat ke lana, pani. It takes six to eight hours to do these things, excluding ki cooking time in India. Just by giving a gas cylinder, you are saving a woman's time by six to eight hours. You know what is the biggest, I must say, is So, we have found as an, I am an academic, I, I never work for India, although I was I was I was not consultant to government, I was member. A member in a Telangana committee, a member with the Prime Minister's committee. I never worked with the government. But as an expert, it is my duty to understand the problems of a particular community, in this case Muslim community, because I am educated and trained to do that. I know how to do the documentation. So use that benchmarks and take, write this story in the language in which the institutions, in which the government, in which the international institutions can understand. Our corporate sector can understand. That is the language in which we have to narrate our problems. And once we have the quality in it, benchmarking, and we have the story to say, and that is how policies are influenced. Such a committee is one such effort. Such a committee was established in 2006. Now, that time government initiated good number of, large number of programs. 
and and after 2006 until now those programs have been running but what we do not know is whether those programs which government implemented or initiated whether they are yielding any results how do you how do you see the result of course there is a big program after such a committee because of such a committee first time in the history of india scholarships were given to muslim children three type of scholarships pre metric scholarship post metric scholarship and then for higher level education scholarships called means come merit almost 25 30 40000 and now for muslim community in many states up to 10 lakh of rupees are given for phd program going abroad ye so pehle nahi the so these these kind of programs have been now formulated in india now you may say what happened now modi aa gaya kuch nahi hua program chal raha okay so i am not getting into that political part in this lecture okay you can talk to me or come to washington dc i give you more information how what is the condition of muslims today under a new government we will come to that later but the important point is how do we communicate our problems to the government can we solve our problems ourselves as a small community by giving arms charity wo to karna hi hai i mean jo farz hai wo to karna hi hai magar where will you spend that money to create a macro effect for the whole community how do you do it the only way to do that is through through policy negotiations why government of india today collects do anybody know here united states government what percentage of its gdp the us collects in taxes anybody you must be probably very something no 12 13% 12 13% of the total gdp 16 trillion out of that 13% is what obama will manage you know as the resource for planet india collects about 12% of 3 trillion dollars how much is that it's about 300 billion dollars 300 billion which is a lot of money is collected by government of india as taxes what for it has to use that to build up a program so through various ministries human resource ministry health ministry education ministry ministry of finance ministry of railways ministry of road transportation agriculture there are many ministries through that there are you know there, there, there are various programs for example now hyv yield somebody was here in uh, you know high yielding variety agriculture you have heard of it right uh, so it was developed in the early period so it is the government which had to develop and give to the farmers and educate the farmers and only those people who had a land could benefit out of it of course it produced more rice it produced more wheat and we as india as a nation became food secure but it benefited which person only the farmer what about a person who doesn't have land but he is a landless laborer how do you benefit him the government has another program to do that it's called national rural employment guarantee scheme so every labor who wants a job they can go and they can register and they will be provided job today it's a small amount of money from our standard but there ek bivi aur do bachcho ko khana khila utna paisa milta hai 200 rupees right so every person who doesn't have a job can go it's like our unemployment benefit here but in a country of 1.5 billion people this program is a big program for poor people now like this there are many 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 programs poverty alleviation and human development programs there are up to about 300 programs in different different different, different ministries and if Karim bhai and me and sit down and we identify which is the top 10 program which will give best benefit. We can identify it. It is possible to do that. But you have to sit with 
those 10 programs if we identify and then we negotiate that with the government. It benefits the whole community. You don't have to know, you don't have to know a person by name. It benefits the whole group, it benefits the whole village, it benefits the whole town, it benefits the whole community. Now, this is what is the US India Policy Institute's mission is. The mission is to do best of its kind research, to write that in the language in which the institutions understand, <coughs> and to negotiate. Now, I want to show uh, a 